You know, when I first laid my eyes on an alt car alternator after getting exposed to the wind generator, the homemade wind generator stuff, uh, my mind immediately thought, you know, why would this not be a great thing to use? You know, how could this not be the perfect wind generator? But you'd read in articles that were written by, you know, the, the two Dans. If you, anybody you guys know what I'm talking about, put a, put a, put a comment in, in down below in the Dan Bartman and Dan Fink. They used to be the authors for the, uh, uh, the otherpower.com site. I think it's become field lines now. Uh, a lot of those websites have been taken down. Um, I, I guess they were expensive to upkeep and, you know, and since then we don't, that was before really YouTube was popular. So it was all about vlogging in those days. You know, people would get on there and they would, they would post pictures and they would, they would write articles and stories and you'd sit there and you'd read them, you know, and now we just watch videos like the one you're watching now. But Dan Bartman and Dan Fink and Hugh P. Joe, don't forget him. That was the, one of the earliest pioneers in the homemade wind turbine. He was doing it way before anybody else. In fact, he invented the, the air core alternator, the, the flux core alternator, okay? The axial flux alternator. A lot of different names that it's been given. But now you see a lot of people, a lot of examples of people building these things. Well, that all came from Hugh Peugeot. And this guy did his homework. I tell you, he had to research everything from scratch. He, he didn't watch videos of people trying to sell this or sell that to you. And, um, you know, and because that's really where the confusion comes from. You'll have someone that'll, that'll make something and they'll say, and they'll, they'll try to market it, you know, and they'll get out there and they'll talk it up. And, and uh, I used to sell wind generator blades and, you know, I would do the same thing. I would get on there, uh, on eBay and I would, I would, uh, I would talk up my blades and, you know, and to the, but to this day, I still think my blades were, were superior to, and I say my blades, they weren't really my design. I was just using the design of Hugh Peugeot, otherpower.com, and a lot of people that went before me that, uh, that, you know, discovered that the airfoil is very important. Of course, there was, you know, companies even before Hugh Peugeot that, that figured these things out, like the Jacobs wind turbine, and, and there was a few other, but the Jacobs was the most popular one. These were actually built back in the early 1900s, you know, the 1920s and 1930s, and put out on farms with battery systems that, you know, we're able to, to run a off grid house back in the twenties and the thirties. Can you imagine that? I was, uh, I had a chance to actually live in a place that once was powered, uh, by this very method. And they had the old glass batteries, all of them still sitting there, you know, with the, with the lead cores, you know, you can see right in there, you can see everything inside the battery. And they used to charge these batteries with the wind generator back in the day and with the Jacobs wind generator. And it was very effective and it worked very good. Uh, and, you know, but then cheap electricity came and, you know, and spread all throughout the countryside. And, and then it just kind of fell out of popularity, if you will. And, uh, but now it's kind of coming back into popularity. <laughs> and I really think it's a great idea because look, self-sufficiency is really the best way to go. You guys see how uncertain things are right now in this world. You know, you can't trust anybody. You can't trust nothing, especially governments. You know, governments have let us down so many times in the past and they've done their people wrong so many times in the past. And so self-sufficiency, those who have been self-sufficient have always gotten through those times. All right, so back to what we're talking about. So the car alternator. So what's wrong with using a car alternator? You know, I've always thought that it would be a good idea to use a car alternator. In some of the old articles that I would read, you know, from field lines, from otherpower.com, and, and even some of Hugh Peugeot's stuff, in those days, there wasn't people using alternators. But I always wondered, why not an alternator? And the answer from these guys were always the same. They're, they're not, uh, the alternator is, is not suitable for wind power. Don't even try to use it, you know? And in my brain, by them telling me that I can't use it, immediately I'm thinking, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna try it. I'm, I have to figure out why these things won't work. I embarked upon this journey to figure out why the alternator won't work. And you know, the first thing I discovered was that you have to spin an alternator really, really fast in order for it to generate usable power in a wind generator setting. In an automobile, that's not a problem. You know, you have anywhere from 50 to 300 horsepower motor with big pulleys and uh, that reduction drive and everything else and really spins those things fast even at idle fast enough 
to easily charge your battery. With the wind generator, this is not the case. You know, you have to spin that thing so fast. I don't think most alternators even begin to reach charging voltage until they're probably at around 1200 RPM plus. And, and remember, you know, most alternators are spinning three to four times faster than the motor is returning. So even at idle, a motor might be turning seven, 800 RPM you know, your alternator is going to be going about 2,400 RPM. So that's the first problem that we have to get around. And a lot of people have done this by taking, uh, they, they've taken out the stator and replaced it with statters with a whole lot more windings and smaller wire. It gives you smaller, you know, it gives you less amperage, but it gives you the higher voltage, the voltage that you need to start actually charging. You know, and here's where the problem starts, okay? So, and the other thing is, is, is the way uh, alternators work is they, they need to most car alternators have an electromagnetic core in them. Their rotor is, is electromagnetic that is powered by two brushes through an electrical circuit, you know, a little brain, if you will, that tells it when to charge and when not to charge. It applies that power on and off, you know, and it's kind of a perfect thing because the alternator can be in the car. If the battery is fully charged, the alternator's off. If it needs power, it turns it on. And so it's able to control the, the current. These little, these little devices are brilliant. Not only are they brilliant, but they're everywhere. They're in every country of the world. They're, they're you know, I mean, th there's junkyards and cars and there's always an alternator somewhere to be found. If I could just unlock that potential of that alternator, I'm thinking, you know, that would, that would really be something because, you know, anybody could have wind power with just a stick of wood, carve a blade, you know, and bolt it onto this alternator and voila, there you go. Uh, instant power. Well, it turns out that the solution that people have come up with is to be is to actually place a, a permanent magnet rotor inside these things. Get rid of the brain, get rid of the brushes, get rid of all that stuff. And all you have to do now is just spin it with no external electricity, you know, energizing those brushes. And it seems like the perfect thing, right? I mean, that's uh, all you really need to do to be able to generate power. A stator that's wired for higher voltage. But here's where the problem begins because with that permanent magnet core you know remember you have iron encasing that entire stator and that iron is so is used so the stator is fully saturated with uh, magnetic flux you know when when the center core begins to energize and and that makes it very efficient but it also makes it that when you put permanent magnets in there the startup is is gonna just cog something terrible. You know, so a lot of the first PMAs that they've come out with had just straight magnets, you know, and they would just be, you couldn't hardly even turn them by hand. They were horrific. And then later on, someone came up with the idea of the slant core and they started putting slanted magnets in these things and it made them a lot better. It started, they started getting better at that point. But, you know, I still have not seen a well-designed core that can, you know, a, a rotor that can, that can turn without cogging. And when I say turn without cogging, I mean taking your two fingers like this and with hardly any pressure, be able to just spin it and for it to go by itself a few revolutions. It has to be very free spinning. I cannot overemphasize this enough. Every single one I've inspected does not meet that criteria so what they've done so what these people have done you know you'll see a lot of these things on sale you know on ebay you'll see them you know everywhere they're all over the place and and they're big business you know a lot of people are buying these things so what they've done is they've taken you know and just put in a whole lot more blades and so these things are now resembling the windmills of old that, that pump water you know and you know how slow those things turn you know they'll go like this you know, and wind turbines turn very, very fast. You know, their, their RPMs are way up there. For a four foot blade, you can reach 1500 RPM pretty easily. Uh, whereas the more blades you put on those, and I have a video explaining wind turbine design. I'll put maybe that link up here. You know, that's a good one to watch. You know, I, I know most of us have driven by at least one wind farm in our life. So, so we see them out there, you know, and those things have, have, have got a lot of money invested into how they operate and to what makes them operate efficiently. And if you notice, none of them will have more than three blades. Some of the early ones even had two blades and even one bladed. Three seems to be the magical number. You know, you go any more than that and you lose your efficiency. Each blade picks up a little bit more wind 
but then the turbulence of the one in front of it begins to disturb the one behind it more and more and more and you you know it begins to drop off after three two blades will spin faster than three one blade will spin faster than two and so on and so forth you get four blades it's slower five six seven and it keeps going slower and slower and slower well you're asking the question already why is slow bad well slow is bad because it's a drop off in efficiency you're you're losing potential energy at that point so a well-designed wind turbine will always have three blades so these alternators cog and they have and so they put a lot of blades on these things to get past the cogging uh, then your wind turbines turning slower so then you have to increase the amount of windings on your on your stator which has decreased the size of the wire which now has allowed a whole lot less amps to flow through it are you seeing where i'm going with this you know and intuitively you guys are probably thinking some of you guys are probably thinking look the more blades you put on there the more power you get well it's not true i know i know you you, you want to think that you want to think that but the science is not there um, the three bladed turbine is the most efficient model it'll spin fast enough to make the most amount of power uh, with the most amount of efficiency and the greatest amount of torque um, that, that you know it's a balance everything's a give and take when you gain in one area you're going to lose in the other and so there's that one point where everything just kind of you know is the perfect little sweet spot and that's what we've come across with with the three bladed versus the four and the five and the six and the eight bladed and i've even seen 12 blade models out there and this is all in an effort to get that thing past the cogging and start these things to turning as the wires get smaller and smaller you know less and less amps are available these things are turning slower and slower and so now you have a wind generator you know maybe six foot in diameter that you know a well-designed wind generator in six foot diameter should create you know in the neighborhood of you know six to eight hundred watts whereas these multi-bladed uh, models are giving you 150 to 200 watts or even less in cases and so and so that's the problem how do you engineer this take this perfect this perfect thing this car alternator and turn it into something that's usable for wind energy 